what you got? Right, call for you. Some, uh, oh, yeah? Okay. Right. Yeah, we said we were going to have some call-in folk. Hold on a second. Yeah, hello? Yeah, it's JPW from WJPW Show on Facebook in the morning and afternoon. Yeah, who is this? Utah Phillips Bruce. Hey, Bruce, what's going on? Oh, yeah? Well, I mean, no, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of anarchist in a way. I mean, no, a collectivity, a co art collective, yeah. Oh, you've seen this kind of stuff before? Oh, yeah. Who told you we were doing this live stream? Oh, really? Joe Hill. Yeah, I sang one of his songs earlier. Uh-huh. They're showing it up in heaven. you got to be kidding me. Really? Wow. Yeah, the Angels 23 I heard from that old Pete Seeger song. Yeah, the Angels 23. They're, they're, they're live streaming it on their page. Well, that's awesome. The Angels 23. That's awesome. What? Yeah, that's a collectivity thing. I don't know if you could label it any one thing. It's not like anarchist or, you know, whatever. You know, everybody wants to get labeled these days. How, how you been? Yeah? I should probably tell people that. Yeah, that they could go to the, the mammoth dot org and make a donation because it is the best donation. Yeah, I stole that from you. I know that. Well, I didn't steal it from you because this is a folk tradition. We borrow stuff. Yeah. You're sitting with Johnny Cash right now. you got to be kidding me. Really? Sarah Ogan Gunning. I figured she'd be up there. Mm-hmm. She's up there in heaven. Well, yeah. We need people to hurry up and give some money because if they don't, the fact, the fact of the matter is is if we might not be able to keep this place. Yeah, it's historical. Uh-huh. Just a little donation would be fine. Sure. Yeah, whatever they got. I mean, even if they just share it from the Facebook page, the Mammoth Louisville, that'd be awesome, too. Y'all don't have Facebook up there? Oh, okay. Just Twitter. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, share the link. That'd be awesome. We got a railroader's kid sitting here with me. I, I, I'm going to have to go. Yeah, no, I worked with his dad on the railroad. Yeah, uh-huh. Well, Utah, I appreciate you calling in. You think what we're doing is good? Mm-hmm. Of course, collectivity. Right. Everybody coming together. That's that right. That's what us l &N folks would say. That right. Okay. Talk to you later. I appreciate you calling in. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. See you on the boat. Take it easy. That was Utah? That was Utah Phillips. He come in. Man, I haven't heard from him in a long time. Yeah. I tell you, we we don't have a crazy man out there getting ready. Come on, do we? Uh, Octo Claus, he come. Just, uh, you and me for a minute, right? Is it just me and you for a minute? Yeah, I believe so. You got a harmonica or something? I got something like that. Holy cat quick, quick What do you got? You know, if you're on the internet, you might not be paying attention, but there's a big thunderstorm coming along. Just so you know, there's a big storm. We don't have one of those boop kind is, of things. So, is there a warning happening? This is it. I don't think it's a big warning, but it's a big storm. So I can make the announcement if we need to. Yeah. You want me to? Yeah. E the National Weather Service has issued a severe absurdity warning on Facebook Live video with this mammoth ordeal. And we got this crazy guy. If you need to hunker in place, you may need to, you may not. Who knows? Look for W, you can go to a, a radio stream that you actually have owned the whole time. You just didn't know it. It's WKIH 43 Weather Radio, and they'll tell you what's up, really. That's WKIH 43 Weather Channel. So I have a feeling that, that, that I'm supposed to play a song with this guy right here. Well, I, I think Do I have to make it up? You got that G? Oh, you got that chromatic. I got, I got the chromatic in the key of C. John, I'm glad that you're sharing this folk tradition with me, man. I yeah, man. Say, yeah. What's your name again? My name's Craig, the son of Sam. You know him well. Yeah, Sam McClurkin. I gotta say, uh, you're one of the most genuine folk musicians I've ever played with all. Well, I appreciate that. You gotta pass it along and, and uh, save it, uh, preserve it, just like this place. So I'll sing a little song about uh, our connection, and you just come on in however you want to. Well, I worked at the railroad with your daddy. 
He, they called him the North End Herd. Back when they put the RCOs, that would be the remote control operators, and they took the engineer's job away. Oh, your papa, I'd work with him almost every day. His name was Sam, oh, Sam McClurkin. So to be here sitting with his son is obviously a lot of fun. Sitting here with railroaders kid that's just how we do it when we're flying by the seat of our pants so give them some I'm going to do what our governor's told us to do. Because I got a cough. And I'm really kind of su uh, subconscious about that. But this room is really dusty. S so can you make some loud noises to, to, to make my cough go away? <coughs> I did it in my arm. Okay, here we go. So go to the website, the Facebook page. <coughs> Whoa. <coughs> there we go. Go to the website or the Facebook page. Don't forget to share this thing with everybody you know. Because that's how you do it, don't you know? So we got some more folks coming up. We're going to talk about some more things about the undisclosed location that we got here. We're trying to raise some money to take care of the foundation of this place. That's what the money is for. Every donation will go to helping to find a way to get this place shored up. It's got some uh, foundational work that needs to be done. And then once that happens, the vision of this entire community can be realized here. The arts and the music and the place to be, especially in these crazy old times. And isn't it amazing what we can all do when we put things together? Just like the railroad that helped to build this place. Oh, the Union Army stored medical supplies in this place. Yoda Lo. Got the old mammoth blue. Got the whole oh, golly gosh, god dang it, we need some money. Good old mammoth blue. All right. Thank you, folks, for your donations, man. We really appreciate everybody that showed out. Just uh, can't say enough good things about Aaron and the other uh, good Samaritans that have dedicated their lives in the arts in our community. And uh, I think it's times like these that we really need to uh, embrace the arts and uh, 
appreciate culture is a really essential thing that connects us all as humans because uh, without that, who are we? You know. Uh, thanks everybody who's supported the Mammoth, Nelligan Hall, the Lava House, and all the uh, bands that have come there, and the artists that have uh, created there. And some of them aren't here with us anymore, and I uh, think about uh, all the people I've collaborated with through our uh, collective art community, and uh, even the ones that are gone, it's like they're still with me, you know? Uh, it's, uh, it's a great thing to have a, a group of people you can uh, create with, you know? And uh, I think with your support, we can ensure that this is around for a long time and for our kids, too. So uh, especially when I think Lou Oldham, there's a great set. And, uh, you know, you, you might have experienced a glitch if you're watching at home or on your car while you're driving with your cell phone. Uh, but, you know, you need to take that up with uh, your Internet service provider. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. In our fault. Not our fault. No. But uh, no. there's more to come. We've got a... We got another hour or two of uh, some pretty exclusive material. You might not have made every show that was at uh, the Mammoth or uh, some of our associated locales, but uh, you didn't miss it necessarily. And uh, we might have a couple of treats coming up for you. Where where is that Octoclaw guy? I don't is know. he, he coming be, or what? He might be on deck, man. Is he on deck? Is is that o what? Octoclaw, you got something for us? We we need some guidance, Aaron. What, are 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 we getting ready to introduce this guy? So, Is that what's getting ready to happen? Okay, I'd like to introduce this feller, and, and I may need your help. Okay. Uh, uh, I first met this guy at an event here at the Mammoth, and his group was playing in the elevator. And I remember walking in and just thinking, oh, this place was already kind of strange already. But then I saw his performance and was like, that, that definitely put the peanut butter on the sandwich. You know what I mean? Absolutely. This was definitely crazy. Uh, uh, so... This is what made me feel like I was, this is my place, you know what I mean? Right. Uh, so I don't know, what What do you know about this guy? Man, uh, is I, know, he suspicious? I know less than you, but uh, is, I know I, he's a hell of a creative individual, and uh, we're glad to have him here. And uh, Is this the without further ado business? Without further ado. Is it? Without the further Octoclaw. ado, here we go with Octoclaw and his briefcase and his weird thing he dredged up from the Ohio River. It's all you, man. Ta-da! All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's me, Octoclaw. Oh, hold on. Is it? I don't know if anybody's calling it or not. Yeah. Is this management? Yeah. Oh, fuck, really? Are you serious? Folks, I'm sorry. I have to cancel the show. I just got a call from management. I'm just kidding. It's fucking mad. But I am going to this banana later. Folks, I am also calling. Yes, I did dredge that up from the banks of the Ohio River near the uh, city of Vive. I don't know if you've ever driven to Cincinnati, but uh, for one point while you're, you're driving through the, across through Indiana. Um, before I start this uh, performance, though, I would like to... Everyone knows the good, the uh, spiritual leader here at the Mammoth, Aaron Conaway. Let's bring him on over here, six feet away from me. There he is, six feet away from me. Aaron Conaway, we can't even touch, see that? But you might, you might notice him from his uh, Facebook profile picture. And that is with this ram skull right here. And it is his birthday, being an Aries and all. Uh, one time he came over to my room to hang out and, uh, and he took that picture. And I said, one day I'll give you this for your birthday. And I forgot about it until like the other day. And I was like, oh shit. Now's the time. So there it is. A ram skull for the Aries. Putting this all together, Aaron Conway. Give so him a round of Thank you. You mean. Sometimes. The on, sometimes when we touch, the honesty is too much. Aaron Conway, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so here, uh, let's go with my little 
my little, what do you want to call us? My segment? Oh, thank you. Hey, give it up for our sound guy here. Good. This is Steve, Woo. right here. Steve Good, is that your name? That's me. Yeah. Steve Good ain't bad, I'll tell you what. Good man. Right there, Steve Good. Keeping us mic'd, keeping us liked, uh, and putting us out on the airwaves. We also got some other, other engineers out there. There's very few of us here. Um, and it, it's really silly because I, I, I don't even know these gentlemen, but I feel like I know them now, even though I barely even remember their names, and it's great. They're lovely people, and we are all keeping a distance, and there's a hand sanitizer station everywhere you look, folks, except for right here, because this is where it gets disgusting. This is when I do things for science and for your entertainment that if you don't donate, I will do. That's right, folks. I am challenging you. If you do not donate, I am going to set this very large animal trap, and I am going to stick one of my most useful appendages right inside of it to be clamped down with all of that all steel, all real pressure, mm, just clamping away on one of my most useful appendages, folks. And if you do not donate right now, this is going to happen, folks. Uh, I, I'm, I'm talking about, it could be a dollar. It could be five dollars. I just need a fucking solid, pardon my French, I am so sorry. For all you kids out there, wash your mouth out with rubbing alcohol. I'm just kidding, don't do that. Uh, just use regular soap. Because that's what I'll be doing later, Mr. Badmouth Town. This is my grandma, I told her I wouldn't curse on national television. But this is a real live, all steel, all real animal trap, folks, and I am about to set it and show you that it works by using the banana phone. <laughs> Ouch. Now, folks, I want to remind you that this trigger is very, very, very sensitive. Just like my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Funny, right? No, not really. Right. If I can gingerly raise this trap up, and you can see what it does to the old banana phone in three, two, one. Ooh, that, oh gosh, that is not pretty. Ah, ooh, it pinched me a little. That is not, ooh, there's meat stuck in there. Oh, that is not pretty, folks. Not pretty. But for the sake of art and for the sake of saving something that allows me to create art, uh, something that has been an artistic outlet for me, a place that we know and love, that most of my performance friends have performed at. That's right, I'm talking to you, performance friends. You've probably performed here. At the, at the mammoth. That's the place I'm talking about. Now, it's really nice for us to be here in this undisclosed location because the mammoth needs some support right now. And uh, this, this, this basement has been donated. Folks, we've been moving around. We've been traveling in individual vehicles, uh, covered, literally, literally covered in saran wrap and rum alcohol. We're, we've been really, really very safe. Um, but if you don't donate now, <laughs> All right, we're, we're only going to give this like a couple more minutes, folks, before this is going to happen because I don't have time for this. We got more acts going on here, and I'm also I got a lot more things lined up for you later on uh, for your viewing entertainment uh, in the next about a half an hour after this or so, maybe 40 minutes, whatever. It's live TV. Who knows what's going to happen? But I'll be back later on to do a little self corvette test. I know that's terrible. I should never said that. That's terrible. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a little something called the human blockhead trick. You're going to see that. It's disgusting. You're going to love it. But we have some people who have donated. Um, and if the donations have reached $50 at least, I will not stick my hand in this animal trap. But you're going to have to make that uh, real quick because I'm itching. I'm itching. <laughs> I'm running out of fucking juice. I need to do this now or never. Folks, it's now or never. And that's how it is for the mammoth. We need to save this thing now or never. Get off your feet. 
If you love art, if you love Louisville, and you don't, don't, don't donate to the Mammoth, then you don't love Louisville. I'm just kidding, folks. Everyone's like, hey, don't say that shit. I'm just kidding around. I'm just kidding. You know that. Jeez. All right, so what do we got? Do the donations reach $50 yet? Have the donations reach $50? Okay, folks, we're not there, so looks like it's time. Now, remember, if you do, if you want to donate to to after you after this happens, if you like what you see, you can also donate uh, for that reason. But it seems we have reached. Looks like we got thirty dollars in donations for me not to do this. <laughs> That's amazing. I've never tried this, folks. But I'm getting ready to do it. What's the final verdict? We're running out of time. We've got donations, but it's, it's, just, not, it's just not hitting that threshold. Okay. Maybe you should apply some guilt. Folks, maybe I should apply some guilt. They say, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply you with some visual stimulation. That's what I'm going to do. Are we ready, ladies and gentlemen? One. Can you see it? Can you see it right there? One. Oh, no. Oh, oh, we got 40. We got $40 in donations. Who wants to play that last 10 or I'm going to do it? $10 in the count of one. Two. Three. Oh, fucking. Look at that, folks. That is all real, all steel, clamping down on my nimble fingers.
Hello? You broke the phone. All right. So, I feel like this is a press conference. So, uh, I want to say a little thanks. I forgot my computer. I'm going to go get my uh, computer. By the way, that was Mr. John Taylor, also known as John Scum, a local old school music hero, um, good friend of ours here at the Mammoth. Um, we've got a serious delay. We're on delay here. Um, so I haven't even walked out of the picture yet. All right, I want to make some big, big thank you shout outs to a number of people here all the way back to three months ago when I first started uh, really pushing this thing, uh, starting with my good buddy Fielding Carroll, uh, who kicked it all off. That was awesome. I got a $10 donation. That was actually my friend Tiffany Ackerman. Uh, Patrick Smith. Daniel Sanders, Mr. Zachary Kendall, uh, good, generous friend, uh, Mr. Robert Warnick in France, another anonymous donation for $100, um, friend photographer, Ruth Mears, Jordan Burns, Sharon Scott, huge supporter. I uh, really appreciate Sharon's support and I've always been a happy, happy to be a part of the radio station. She's an XOX manager and founder. Uh, Mr. Jesse Simpson, very generous, very generous donation. Um, about a month ago, uh, Jay Grady, thank you. Adam Barnett, my old uh, roommate from college. He's out in uh, Seattle now, thinking about him in these isolated, tough times. Uh, working for Microsoft, keeping us... Uh, Streaming. Uh, Claire Robb, thank you. Anonymous, Anonymous loves us. Uh, JL Harrington, thank you. Anonymous. Virginia Lee, thank you. Matthew Mazoda, a uh, great, great internationally known artist. Um, very generous donation. Colin Trask, thank you, thank you. Uh, Lydia Comer, Old friend, uh, Anastasia Hagerstrom, thank you. My mother, Carol, thank you, Mom. Hope you're doing well. Hope to see you soon. Uh, Tara Midkiff, thank you, thank you. Uh, we have Jeffrey Carr, the generous donation, thank you. And another generous donation from Jose Manuel Garcia Cardoso, our uh, other good friend in Spain. I uh, hope you guys are doing well and staying safe and uh, healthy. Been thinking about you guys a lot. Uh, thank you to Danielle Kopez, um, which I imagine is, uh, she's related to Paul Kopez, Paul K. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, donation from Roxel Carr. Thank you. Another one from Zachary Kendall. Two times, yes, we will not discourage. Uh, donating twice, thank you so much. Another anonymous, um, my friend Valerie Omont, thank you, Valerie. Uh, Mr. Brett Ralph, who uh, we heard from earlier with that awesome piece from the cemetery uh, with um, Mark Hamilton, and wanted to shout out to Rita Cameron for the video on that. And uh, that was a Paul K cover. And uh, thank you to Blair Riggle. Thank you, Blair. Really appreciate it. Uh, anonymous. We've got a Sarah B. And a John Myers. And uh, very generous, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, keep it coming. We'll get there. We're going to get there. Uh, got two more hours tonight. So, uh, you know, see what you can uh, peel off. And we'll get this place going. And it'll pay off. In the future, we're going to get this basement fixed, get some other things fixed in here, and kick these doors open and have the creativity flowing again. Um, it's incredible to have some stuff going on in here uh, with our little, our little safe skeleton crew. Um, but, and a million thanks to everybody who's performing and uh, talking tonight. And Will Oldham was just 
I think everybody will agree was just mind blowing. So that was really beautiful and necessary. So uh, yeah, and another thanks to James Gardner. Um, that's just popping up. This might be on delay a little bit here, but uh, do stay tuned. If the stream cuts out again, uh, stick with us. We'll be sure to have it up in five, seven minutes tops. We're uh, tangling with the technology. So. And folks, that's how you prevent. I don't really know what that prevents, folks, but keep your hands clean. Make sure you wash your hands after anything touching your face. Uh, keep yourselves clean. Keep yourselves at least six feet away from your friends and uh, your coworkers. If you have to work, you're a goddamn trooper. Gosh darn it. Folks, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to take this a moment to really introduce what we're here for doing this. Uh, is my nose bleeding right now? Thanks for checking. Uh, folks, I'd like to introduce our spiritual leader here at the Mammoth, the guru, the ghost in the darkness. When you're like, what the hell? Look at that cool art. Who did that? Probably yours and mine, our fellow friend, Bananagement, Aaron Conway. This is a video that we've been working on. If you have not watched it on the GoFundMe page or on the website, um, in between broken segments of the show here, uh, we're going to play it through one time just so uh, you can see it on the big screen. And uh, hope you enjoy it. It ha has been a lot of fun and got a lot of feedback from people as we worked on it. really helped kind of explore what this thing is all about. And I think that was maybe lightning. Maybe it was a flash. That was weird. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, we're going to throw this video on, and we'll be back in a bit. we got quite a bit more programming out there in the world. Hopefully nobody gets uh, drowned out at home before we can uh, get them in on the live stream, but we'll see what happens. Stay safe, and uh, let it roll. It's their feeling that there'll be these pockets of light springing up in different parts of the world where people can come and reconstruct a new future. Not so long ago in the land known as West Louisville, an assembly of artists chose a worthy structure made of brick and heavy timber to build a magical space together. They named the project The Mammoth. The Mammoth. Providing an underground for the arts, while enchanted with a spirit of the past, they manifested their positive vision for the future, emanating constructive energy. Several magical years passed, and the folks of the Mammoth created boundlessly in this epicenter of light, life, and culture. Artists and diverse audiences came together, bringing health, beauty, and empowerment to the world. In her fourth year, however, a dark cloud rolled in. State authorities found rot at the base of the mighty structure, with damage to several of the Mammoth's basement posts. They judged her body too worn, and the building was closed to the public. The mammoth was left still, silent, and lifeless. Locked down, no one allowed to pass through her doors. She was no longer allowed to bring people together to experience abundant self-expression and free creation. 
Although an end to the mammoth seemed inevitable, the artists refused to abandon their old companion. Nothing could prevent them from saving this community resource. They passionately filled her outdoor spaces with new creative fire, birthing new life and energy. They nurtured her spirit from outside the earthen walls. They worked the land, created among the trees. They built spectacular gardens where everyone was welcome, regardless of their origin. From these roots, a collective was born, the Mammoth Collective. Honoring her history as a warehouse built by the Union Army, once filled with healing supplies for the Civil War wounded, the artist assembly's creative expression, DIY spirit, and collaboration across disciplines, genres, races, ages, and other distinctions, the artist kept the dream alive, breathing life into her so she could bring healing to the world. Now, at the turn of a new decade, the mammoth is readying to rise to her feet again to help carry our city forward into a 2020 vision as the nation's model of a fully human and sustainable community. With nearly 20 years experience in collective art spaces and DIY culture, we'll develop Louisville's version of the fully immersive art environment, employing artists and many other creative people along the way. Hi, I'm Aaron, Keeper of the Mammoth. To acquire the deed to the warehouse and complete required repairs, including the basement columns, I'm borrowing $160,000 from the Metro Bank, which means the Mammoth needs $40,000 down payment at the beginning of April or else the entire project will be terminated and the building relinquished. We're here asking friends, family, community stakeholders, lovers of art, music, culture, and community involvement to help raise the $40,000. To quickly reach the goal of turning this building into a fully operational community resource in West Louisville, you can truly help by contributing right now. Our hearts are warmed and humbled as we all come together to rehabilitate this building and take our plan to the next level. As the mammoth reawakens, please consider throwing a little something in the hat. $40,000 is a lot. Whether it's a dollar, ten dollars, twenty, or five hundred, it will add up. We'll soon have this boundless resource open again. Let's do this together. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The purpose of this underground is to find out how to preserve the light, life, the culture, how to keep things living, a, a language of the heart, some kind of language between people that is a new kind of poetry, that's the poetry of the dancing bee that tells us where the honey is. about a sense of place because that's what we're doing kind of sort of I learned this song from some folk musicians in this town uh, who had learned it from a woman named Jean Ritchie she was a Kentucky songwriter Just a curly headed baby. Papa sat me down upon his knee. He said, Son, go to school and learn your letters. Don't you be dusted, coal miner like me. I was born and raised the mouth of the hazard holler. Coal cars rumbling past my door. 
Now they're standing in a rusted row empty Because L and N, no, it don't stop here anymore Well, I used to think that my dad, he was a black man With enough script to buy the company store Now he goes downtown with empty pockets And his face is white as the February snow I was born and raised the mouth of the hazard holler Cold cars over rumbling past my door Oh, but now they're standing in a rusted row empty mm -hmm. Because C&O don't stop here anymore Well, sometimes we go down, down by the Green River To an abandoned old prison down by Avery Hill where the air smell like snakes Oh, we shoot with our pistols All but empty pop bottles Was all we would kill And daddy, won't you take me back Oh, to Muhlenberg County Down by the Green River Where a paradise lay but I'm sorry, my son, but you're too late in asking. Mr. P about his cold train has done hauled it away. stop here anymore because CSX don't stop here anymore yeah so folks passing down a folk tradition and passing down an artist tradition and holding our community is exactly how we create and we hold these traditions and that's exactly what this Mammoth Collective is all about. It's about people coming together to have a safe place in our community to create. And uh, I've been a part of this uh, on and off here and there, in and out of this uh, collective for a while now. <coughs> I was organizing a, uh, a labor uh, place in this room right here before everything had gotten shut down. And, uh, it's got some of my son's art over on the wall. It's got some railroad hobos I brought into town. Some people, New York Tomato over there, has got some artwork up on the wall. And we've got a lot of memory already built up in this place, uh, not to mention it goes all the way back to 1865. 
So the, the history and the sense of place that we all seem in this community in Kentucky, in Louisville, we have something really special here. We, we've got something incredibly special in this building, in a historical place. So it would be great if you could go to the website, go to the GoFundMe uh, that's, that's on the Facebook and it's on the, the mammoth.org page and donate what you can. And as certainly we understand that in these days and times as it is right now, there's a lot of people that are pulling on your, your purse strings and your heartstrings for donations and things. Uh, but we, we had a lot of reservations about even going through with this at this time, but we decided that uh, we're from Kentucky and we're nuts and uh, the show must go on. Uh, that's what it is we decided to do. We've been extra careful. We've uh, brought in Will Oldham and made sure that he come in here and really didn't have hardly any contact with anybody. Same thing with what we're doing out, out here. We're all just kind of trying to keep a distance from each other, but remain. And that's the, the big struggle of the day, it seems, is, is finding ways to get close. Um, so th for real, that's, that's a big part of what we need to do here is uh, we need to hold our community but uh, in, in the best way that we can given the, uh, the, the, the hardships that we've been given these days. I believe we're going to have to go somewhere else. Isn't there, it, it, what, what, Octoclaw's got something going on, don't he? Is, is he coming in here? He's going to do something crazy again, I bet. Are you, is your finger okay? I don't know if you noticed this or not, Mr. How many times have I been asked that question? What, what, well, Mr. Claw, I got, I got to get your advice. You seem, Can you say that again? what's that, Mr. Claw? Mr. Claw? Yeah, Mr. Claw, I got to ask you your, you like I gotta ask you some advice because I, when I was out there on the railroad, I accidentally cut my finger off, and it's it's been a problem ever since. And maybe since you seem to be a, are you a professional? Are you a professional at this? Oh yeah. Well, maybe you can tell me what the hell happened. See, because when I was out there on the railroad, I, I a flange. Oh, and I can I, see it. And I can keep doing there that. There it is. And I can scare little kids with it sometimes. Wow. Do, do you have a fix for this? I gotta I mean, tell you. You got a staple gun. I'm afraid what you might gonna do with I that. I do have a fix for it, and it is my best friend, folks, the industrial I, size staple gun. And I'm gonna give you, you your space. Still, just for a second. No, please not. I can I, show you how it. I, I, look, man, I don't know. You know what I mean? All right, all right. Look, you're the professional in this category. I'm, now, folks, can you guys hear me? Do I need to move this microphone? I'm the Kentucky ham. Hey, you're, you're, there it is. The wow. Thank you for moving that mic for me. Now, folks, here I have my. My best friend in the whole world, my industrial-sized staple gun. Now this little sucker right here is, uh, it's known as, a, what is it? I'm pretty sure this is, the, this is the upgrade model. Yeah, this is the T50R, which means ridiculously strong, folks. Now this thing shoots live staples out of it. I can show you, uh, which camera can I shoot a staple at? This one or that one? I won't hit it. I've got pretty good aim. Shooting at this camera right here. Here we go. Shooting a staple in. Oh, hey, whoa, don't, everybody, come on. Don't run. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss. Folks, <laughs> all three of the crew all ran away. So we're we going with that one or that one? Which one? Very left. That one, that one. All right. Am I aiming right at the one I need to be? Bye! Get out of the... Joe! Oh. Benagement <laughs> had something to say about that one. Now, folks, uh, this is my industrial size T50 staple gun. And uh, for your donations, folks, we've got a, a lot of donations, and I feel like it's worth it. I only have a little bit of cash on me. In fact, this is the only cash I have to my name. Uh, I'm not getting paid. I don't have a check. All my gigs have been completely canceled. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are going through a lot of similar things to that. But I have a 10 and I have a 1. Of course, the 1 gets stapled to a mediocre place like my, my arm. But where do you think the 10 is going to go, folks? Stay tuned. Uh, I'm going to need a little assistance over here. Somebody with gloves on, please. Are we out of gloves? Do we have any more gloves from last night? Do we have any more gloves from last night, guys? Do we, any, do we have any more lube from last night? Oh, oh my gosh. Dang. All right, it's okay. I can do it myself. I just, uh, you know, social distancing and everything, folks. 
Uh, we're not going to have anyone else do this. I'm going to do this to myself, which is kind of hard to do. Now, normally I'll make a joke, folks, about... Do- oh, oh sh- folks, we are not out of gloves, it turns out. Pop those bad boys on and come and introduce our video tech. Going to do some work. Now, there's only a few of us. In fact, before it's all over, we're going to introduce all of our boys. we got Steve on audio. we got the video tech. And what was that dude who does magic's name? That guy, was it? Craig, that's right. Craig the Magician out here, too. Doing rad shit. Okay, so I noticed you put the gloves on, then immediately touched your pants. Go get some new gloves. I'm just fucking around. Here you go. Take that right there. Uh, come and stand on this side. I think it's best for the view. Now, folks, this, uh, I'm sorry about this. Hopefully, that we won't get any trouble for that. I'll go ahead and to, uh, cover up that nasty, ugly male nipple. We don't want to see that. Hey, there's no staples in here. Oh, no, there are. And you're about to prove it to the whole audience. That's George Washington. Right there. Hit him right between the eyes for me. One. Right between the eyes. Two. Two and a half. Two and three quarters. Three. Oh, shnikes. I stole that from an old comedian that I used to like. Ow. And every time I get hurt, sometimes I say that. Now, if you, you're, you're not everyone's going to get to see this. In fact, no way. Actually, everyone's going to get to see this. I'm going to wait. Good, I'll good. pull it out. Uh, I'll pull it out closer to the camera, folks. And I'm talking about the staples. All right, so you're not done, though, because you're the only glove one in the house. Normally, folks, whenever pe- people bring up a, a larger bill, they just staple some better real estate, some better tracts of land, if you know what I'm talking about. A little more expensive piece, folks. And for this, we're going to go for the... Uh, for the mammoth, we're going to take this one straight to the belly basket, folks. Straight to the belly basket for the mammoth here. Right between the eyes on the count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> and there you have it, folks. Your donations, every single one of them counts. Real life blood money. Uh, I also sterilized each one of these dollars, and I sterilized all those staples. And this man is wearing gloves. That's the closest anyone's ever got on this show, for the record. But the camera's going to get super close right now, just so each and everybody can see. This is a graphic warning factor. If you are grossed out by things, do not watch right now, but also donate lots of money. Donate lots of money. All right. Can you hear me? This way. That was very. That was great. Yeah, I think we're gonna hear some thunder. Just a little feeling. All right. So next up, and thank you, Octoclaw. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the Ram Skull. That's amazing. All right. So uh, next up is a friend from. Santa Fe, New Mexico, my good, good friend, Damien Taggart, he wrote a poem and his friend transcribed it, and uh, he's going to be reading it to us live from a safe place. Hello. 
Um, my name is Damien Taggart, and I'm a human being. It's about, um, I don't know, it's probably about half an hour before sunrise. I'm here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I'm sitting in my closet because, well, I don't know if you've heard, but there's a virus, and... This seemed like a pretty safe place to be because there's no other humans here. And anyway, I wrote a poem that I wanted to share with you. I'm going to first read it in Spanish and then I will read the English version. I wrote it in English and my friend Guillermo Canedo uh, translated it for me, so please bear with me. It's called Reprando de Todos Modos. Hay pánico general, generalizado sobre un virus o alguna muerte. Hijo de puta del azar, que tal el clima primavera? Que tal el clima Primaveral. Se me matan, me matan, me matan. Que es el alboroto. Ansiedad generalizada como una enredadera deslizándose por la ciudad, pero por aquí, en estas cuatro paredes de nada especial, nos sentimos bien, pero tal vez cansados y a veces tristes. Es un privilegio sin duda. Es un privilegio sin duda pero no se basa en esquemas de categorización de personas como raza o economía. Para la valentía frente a una muerte incierta está disponible a tasas de descuento en el callejón del corazón donde los matones donde los matones del patio de la escuela vendemos antagonismos increde, incre, incre, increíblemente increíblemente baratos ¿Ya ha pasado algo? ¿Algo pasa alguna vez? Hay miedo generalizado y el miedo es un monstruo escondido en salas de, viri, vi, en salas de vidrio. En tiendas de lavado y lubricación de mediana edad y de una Parada. Podemos cantar mañana, podemos reparar un ala rota y enseñarle suavemente al toro ojirado a luchar nuevamente por el vuelo, aunque volar con un, aunque volar con un a la quizás no tenga gracia, por aquí es lo que tenemos. For those of you who speak Spanish, lo siento. Here it is in English. Mending, anyway. There's widespread panic about a virus or some death-dealing motherfucker of chance. How about the spring weather? 
If I'm killed, I'm killed, I'm killed. What's the fuss? Widespread anxiety like a slithering vine around the city. But around here, in these four walls of nothing special, we're feeling fine but tired maybe and sometimes sad. It's privilege, no doubt. But it's not based on person categorization schemes like race or economics. For fearlessness in the face of an uncertain demise is available at discount rates in the back alley of the heart, where schoolyard bullies sell antagonisms unbelievably cheap. Has anything happened yet? Does anything ever happen? There is widespread fear, and the fear is a monster, hiding in halls of glass, in middle age and one-stop wash and lube shops, a monster of the blackness that you can't see behind your very eyes. Can we sing tomorrow? Can we mend a broken wing and softly teach the rusty thrush to fight again for flight? Though flying with one wing is maybe graceless, around here, it's what we got. Thank you, humans on Earth. Um, I hope that you learn something. What do I hope? I hope that you learn to find courage before you perish, whether it's from a virus or something else. Okay, well, it's getting to be the uh, it's getting getting to be the tailwaters of what it is that we're doing here, and uh, we most definitely have to thank everybody who has donated so far. Uh, this show with the t tonight, Thomas Butler, uh, we've raised over a thousand dollars, maybe a little bit more. Um, so you know, go to the website, go to uh, the Facebook page, the Mammoth in Louisville, and. You'll find the live videos and that we've done all night. And uh, thank the uh, folks that's been in here to uh, donate their, their time and their, their, uh, their resources and their expertise. Uh, we're going to have a monologue here in a second. And uh, what else do we need to say, Aaron? Is, is, uh, was there anybody specific we need to thank? Can you start saying some of the names of the folks that uh, we've had on the show? Yeah. Yeah, John Taylor. John Taylor was on the show. <laughs> John Taylor. Yeah. Uh, Terry. Yeah, uh, we heard from Tari SB. Uh huh. Some great stuff. Had Octoclaw. To, had to interrupt him a little bit. Octoclaw. Excellent. Yeah. Paul Wright. Yep, yep. It up. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Uh, Jameson Welsh. Jameson Welsh. Welsh. Has, uh, come up with some. Uh, he's got another one. Uh, we're going to try to call him in in a little while. Um, see if he is still available. Uh, Johnny Cash. We still got Johnny Cash. Yeah, he's calling. Yeah. Uh, Where's that phone? If he shows up. Where's that uh, phone? Well, we wait till he calls. But oh, I, okay, I okay. Oh, okay. Uh, we broke the banana phone. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, I broke the cord on the other banana phone. Oh, man. We're, uh, we're fine. Well. Uh, let's see. Um... Oh, Brett, Craig Brett Ralph at the beginning out. of this ordeal. Brett Ralph, and, uh, Mark Hamilton. Mark and, Hamilton, uh, yeah. Rita Cameron on video. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we had some other stuff. That was Damien Taggart, my good buddy Damien. And uh, we've got a Richard Campbell piece out there. Uh, All right. I'm waiting to deliver. I'm going to see if I can get him on. Gregory. Uh, and Greg Gregory Gre Cheney. Gregory yes. Cheney, uh, right, right. Good morning. And we're also looking to do more diversity next time. This is our pilot project. And, uh, you know, we really want to get some more stuff out there. So, or in here, out there, in here, and then out there. And we've got somebody coming up to do a, uh, a piece. Are you, are you ready now? Uh, yeah, we've, we've got somebody else queued up. Got somebody else queued up. Oh, yeah, Danny's on the next. Danny's coming up. Oh, Danny's on next. Okay, so Danny from his bedroom with his 
guitar, I believe. I can see the fear in the eyes of men The ancient flame that is to blame For every horror that has come and went Is hungry again For the dreams in our heads Every hope we ever had Never expecting the world to end Seem to get, we always end up right back where we started. Did we departed? Please forgive us. But we are poor, misguided misfits, trying to find a way to find out who we are as the world falls apart. All around us, and yet we take part of the hell that we're living in, but we haven't given in just. All the things that slow us down in this life When does a spark become a flame? When does a loss turn into gain? When does a scorching flame become a guiding light? As the world falls apart All around us again We take part Of the hell that we're living in But we haven't given in just yet So, Aaron, what did you say about, did, did you say, did you get a text back from him? Yeah. What did he say? Uh, yeah, he texted his, uh, he, he said he'd give you this number, so. Uh, oh, okay. He wants to talk on his cell phone, he wants to talk on his cell phone. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, this, uh, this is really special. Uh, you know, earlier in the show, we had, uh, we had, uh, Utah Phillips, Bruce Utah Phillips, call into the show. I, I do these funny interviews on my Facebook thing, WJPW uh, News Report. I don't know if Aaron's figured out where I'm stealing that from, the WJPW morning announcements. You don't remember the WJGB morning announcements from the Brown School? Anyway. Oh, that's right. You ain't a Brown School. you one of them freaky Atherton people. Well, anyway, I do these crazy things where these people call in and, and I talk to them on the phone, so... We, we've got Johnny Cash's number, but we texted him. He said, I got to call him at this number, so I was going to do that. Uh, this is a number that goes all the way up to heaven uh, on a black phone, of course, as you can see. So this is pretty dang special, to tell you the truth. Uh, so once we get a chance to get him in there, patched in. Uh, so here we go. Yeah. Hey, yeah, Johnny, how's it going, man? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wanted to ask ask you a question. Uh huh. Is it important to hold folk music and art and 
crafts and things like that, is it important to hold that close to your heart? Uh huh. You really? So the Dalai Lama, yeah. Yeah, so you've been listening to the Dalai Lama, huh? And that's what he would say? Yeah. Yes, it is all about the heart. Yeah. Well, what about this man in black business? We got a black phone. Yeah. Oh, to downtrodden. Mm-hmm. And the people that have been right, the most, the hardest people that, yeah. Well, see, that's what we're doing here at this place. I mean, do you support collectivity in the arts? Oh. Ah, oh, so that's what that was all about, that man in black business. Oh, okay, sure, yeah. Well, we, no. Right. June is there, too. Who else is in heaven right now sitting around his phone call? Oh, really? Well, t well you're right. Tell her I thought that I, I tried to sing that song from the heart. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Gene Ritchie's an incredible. Yeah. Who else? Oh, really? Muhammad Ali and Howard Cosell. Holy cow. I'll tell you what. Um, we don't want to keep you. I mean, we know it's busy up there. You, you probably in high demand. Uh, right? Are you going to donate? Oh, they don't do PayPal in heaven? Oh, okay. Is that a folk song? You just wrote it? Oh, really? They don't do PayPal in heaven. Everything comes from the heart. Is that it? I thought I heard that before. No, Mr. Cash, we really do appreciate it. So we, we really felt like we needed to call you because you're the guy with the last name of the thing that we actually need. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, whatever you got. I mean, it's kind of like that Cadillac that you built from stealing all that stuff and sticking it in your cooler. Uh-huh. You can give us 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65 dollars is fine. That one, you know that? Yeah, the mammoth is definitely like that psycho Billy Cadillac. I tell you what, it's, there's crazy stuff going on all over the place. Mm-hmm. Well, we appreciate you calling and letting us call you. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, yeah. He was on earlier. Well, he he had to go. We, yeah, he just kind of popped in and left. But I'll t I'll tell Will that you you said hello. Mhm. Mm yeah, he's a special guy. Mhm. Mm yeah, he's kind of our prince of the city. Yeah, he's, he's he he really throws himself out there sometimes and uh, and helps out to, in the community at the radio station and various causes. It's uh huh. I'll tell Aaron, I, I, I just, mm -hmm, I'll tell him for sure. Okay, Johnny, right? No, I quit the railroad. Mm-hmm. Steamboat? Yeah, come on down. I'll introduce you to York and Sacagawea and everybody. Yep. All right, then. That's right. Okay, I'll see you on the boat. Yep, tell June I said hello. Mm-hmm. Okay, Southern Charm. Keep it going. Got it. All right. Take care. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Take care. All right, bye-bye. Well, that was awfully special. Uh, Johnny Cash said that what we need to do is just keep it real, and, and that's what we're trying to do, I guess. Uh, keep it real absurd is a good way to do it. Uh, comedy and silliness and art and uh, uh, vaudeville performances, uh, 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 live uh, 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 piercing on the air, you know. Uh, we got, uh, you know, we, we've got so much stuff in this place that if you wouldn't be inspired just walking into this place, you would really be hard pressed uh, to say that you're a, a creative person. This place, the Mammoth, is uh, an incredible, incredible place located right here on 13th Street down from Broadway. And if you're like around Louisville, it's down from the old l &N building and it's a very historical. It's been here for eight, since 1865, so it's hard to miss, it's huge. Uh, and what we need you to do is give a, a donation, whatever you got. Just go to the Facebook page and uh, go to themammoth.org and uh, do, do us a favor and help support the arts in this community and in, in the greater community as we bring and collaborate with people from all over the globe. Uh, we've got the big thunderstorm coming now, and uh, it's going to wash all of the... Uh, Wash our the streets clean, as they oh, say. Man. Can you cover the tempest later? Oh, my. I don't have the lyrics on that one. But I 
Hope my friends, they drink themselves to death. Woo! Yeah. And I hope she curses me with her last breath. That's Sean Garrison. Yeah. Can we say his name on the air? He's a rat. Yeah, he's got yeah. all that fancy art. Yep. All right, so we'll what we got here. next? Uh, next up, we have our own uh, Mr. Craig McClurkin with a story. Where's the fish tanks and the money? Y'all told me we was going to be putting lots of money in the fish tanks. Is this not like the crusade I think for we're children? Going to do that on uh, episode. You think we've been doing good job? Good enough we job need fire boots. Two? I think I think we need to add fire boots and money pouring it into fish tanks. All right. You think? Yeah. We got so, Sean. Mc, uh, we we got a little money coming in, but we're gonna have to push it. So we we've got do this again. we've got McClurkin coming, and this be Craig. What do y'all think? Should we do it again? Yeah, I think we should. Yeah. Uncle Eddie can't be here with us to share his story. But his story is my story, so I know it well. Uncle Eddie see yarn about the Cuda. I was seven years old the first time I saw somebody try to kill Fidel Castro. My mother brought me and my brother John to the Plaza de Revolucion to listen to the Comandante blame the gringos for everything. We were hungry as usual, and suspicious that every word out of this guy's mouth was bullshit. And we weren't the only ones. Right in the middle of Patria o Muerte Vinteremos, a guy pushes his way through the crowd, pulls a pistol, and takes two shots at Castro. He was 30 feet from the stage. Fidel was stunned for a second. He looked down to see if he was hit. He slowly cracked a cocky grin and started punctuating with his cohiba. 20 years, I train you to be the perfect soldier, and you miss? I'm very disappointed. Find him. And of course, he didn't get very far. Three minutes later, it blew his brains all over the plaza. There were two TV stations in Cuba, Channel 2 and Channel 6, and the speech was on both that night. We didn't want to see it in person, and we were not interested in the rerun. I asked my mom if we could go out and play until the state broadcast was off. When Fidel was off the air, could sometimes pick up Humphrey Bogart movies from Florida, as long as they didn't order a mandatory blackout, apagón. When they did, that was it. There were no generators, no lamps, porch lights, street lights, and they pulled the plug without any warning any time they felt like it. We lived with my uncle at his girlfriend's house on a hill at the end of the street. The yard ends at a bluff, so John and I are playing catch, running around, and wouldn't you know it, I'm right in mid-stride and the apagón hits. Pitch black. I run right off the ledge and break my left arm above the elbow. It's hanging loose. There's no ambulances in Cuba. Buses run once an hour. They're always full and they may or may not stop to let you on. So what if you're carrying a crying kid? All kids in Cuba are crying. It took four hours to get to the hospital. Mom carried me for at least half of it. When we got there, we waited for the next ship to come on. And when I finally saw the doctor, I was his first operation ever. He had no idea what he was doing and he completely screwed my arm up. The next day he tried to cut my arm off to get rid of the evidence of his mistake. Very typical of communism. Luckily, mom was ready. If you cut his arm off, I'm going to burn your fucking house down, doctor, with your family in it. She handed him a slip of paper with his address on it. Cuba is a nation of spies. Every fourth person is on the police payroll. The only tactic we have is to counter surveil. She thought she might have trouble from this guy, so she followed him home that morning. Mom was a soldier, the first and last line of defense for her kids. She never left her post either. When we ate dinner, once our plates were clean, she'd ask if we were still hungry and give us hers if we were. We stayed hungry, but we weren't starving. Fidel kept the starvation in the prisons. The army ate first, then the people, and if anything was left, then the enemies and criminals. Mango trees were everywhere, but they were all picked over, except for the ones over the fence on the army base. You could be shot from the guard tower or chased by German shepherds, but that didn't stop us. We finally figured out that the guard would let us pick as many as we could carry if we went and sold them and brought them back cigarettes. It was miserable. Everybody was spying on each other, and the cops could lock you up and throw away the key. Nobody had any money, and there was never anything on the shelves at the bodegas. But Cuba's paradise. It's a two-hour walk to Bucuracano Beach. We'd wake up at 5 a.m. and get there as the sun came up. We'd drink coconut water all day. 
We'd go spear fishing with the spear made from a mop handle and an army truck tire inner tube. There's a Spanish fort and a hundred foot concrete bridge over the river. People fish for bull sharks that swim up into the river's black water. In the morning, the hammerhead sharks swim in from the emerald ocean following the stingrays over the white sands. With fins and masts and our homemade spears, we'd swim from the green water over the sand, past the pier, and into the deeper sapphire water over the barnacles. You take a deep breath and dive as deep as you can, and it's beautiful. There's so much life. It's a whole other universe. You don't want to come back up, but you run out of air, and you have to. So you get as much air as you can fill your lungs with and dive straight back down. We dive up to 80 feet and catch 20 pound grouper and yellowtail, octopi and sea turtles. It's no wonder Kere and Tortuga are endangered species. They taste better than the best steak you've ever had. Filet mignon is not even close. Maybe we'd find somebody with charcoal at the beach and grill right there. Sometimes people would have professional fishing equipment. They let us borrow it and we'd share what we caught with them. And diving wasn't just for food. John and I used to dive into the deep purple water and get big two-foot conch shells. If you put a hook through their foot and hang it from a branch, it would hold on to the shell for five or six days. But the snail will finally uncoil as much as three feet and drop the shell. Fry it with olive oil and garlic and lime like cow tongue. We'd steal a light fixture from a police station or a neighbor's porch, and then saw off one side of the conch shell, stick the light inside, and cement it to a starfish for a base. With a little glitter added to the cement, the lamps looked perfect. They had beautiful layers of glowing pink and cream bands. We could take one to Hemingway's house and sell it for 25 pesos. The average weekly salary in Cuba was 50 pesos, or $2. We lived in La Rosita, a 30-minute walk from San Francisco to Pabla. Canadians, Germans, Italians, Russians, Poles, and Ukrainians were always on the 10-acre estate. There are tall fences around the avocado and mango trees and the Hemingway cats. They're well-fed and protected. They will lock you up if you poach one. Any other cat in Cuba is probably going to be fricasseed with tomato and coconut. It's a two-story white concrete mansion with a patio on the roof. His 46-foot yacht, Pilar, is on stilts out in the front yard. That was the first boat I ever saw out of the water. I couldn't figure out how it got so far inland. There are lots of guns and safari pictures all over the walls and tusks. There are big marlin, 10 feet with a sword, 1,200 pounders. There are impala, lion, tiger, zebra, and a brown bear. He could have bagged the greatest trophy of them all, Fidel. They were buddies. He could have picked the time, the place, and the gun. All he had to do was say, hey, let's go hunting. Ernest Hemingway was a soulless clown, just like Dennis Rodman, sucking off a narcissist, a mass murdering baby Stalin. Hemingway was a reporter. He knew Che executed tens of thousands of people, and he knew Fidel Castro killed more than 100,000 Cubans. That's why he blew himself away with a shotgun. He didn't have the guts to whack Fidel. It's not surprising. He was Castro's friend. What is surprising is that the terror hadn't completely broken the will of the guy in the crowd who took two shots at the Comandante. He had the balls to shoot at him, but not the nerve to aim straight. Nobody ever tried Stalin like that. I think it's something about our Spanish blood. Of course, Fidel would have made Hemingway disappear just like anybody else the second he didn't have a use for him. But Hemingway was a propaganda coup while he was alive, and a tourism boom when he was dead. And Fidel urgently needed foreign currency. The blockade forced Cuba to be a client of the Soviet Union. Fidel sent Che to Russia to get some guns, but Khrushchev sent him back with a bunch of nukes. Fidel thought Che had tried to step over him, and the boss learned how to hold a grudge from Stalin. He'd wait a few years to send Dr. Guevara off to the Bolivian jungle and sell him to the CIA. See, Khrushchev thought he was playing chess with Kennedy. His move worked, but only when the president got a call to let him know that a couple of Russian generals had turned up dead. Castro wanted those launch codes, and sooner or later he was going to get them. Kennedy pulled the nukes out of Turkey directly. Khrushchev agreed to take back the nukes. Fidel was furious. Every man, woman, and child in Cuba demonstrated daily. We marched through the halls at school. Nikita! Marakita! Los misiles no se quita! They pulled them out, but I think Castro kept a couple as an insurance policy. Think about it. The Americans never bucked up to him after the Bay of Pigs. Why else haven't they messed with Cuba since? Because of their respect for other nations or their good manners? I don't think so. Castro showed up at the UN around that time and a reporter asked him, Do you think Cuba and the United States will ever have normal relations? Yes. When? 
when America has a black president. Say what you will about Castro, but he understood race. Under Batista, blacks were insulted and had no opportunity. So Fidel recruited them. He made everybody equal, equally poor. But if you had any racist sentiment, you were going on someone's list and then in front of a firing squad. And now there's no discrimination in Cuba. Everybody was poor and the economy was failing. And then Russia quit overpaying for sugar, so Fidel had no choice but to let Americans come and spend their tourist dollars. It created a huge paradox. The cracks in his lies started to show. He's been swearing that America's the devil and they're worse off than us. But here come everybody's relatives. They're all well fed and they've got pictures of their cars and houses. Our families weren't lying to us, Fidel was. So the anti-Castro backlash grew. People were sabotaging army trucks and bombing police stations. My brother and I even tore up some police cars. And of course Castro's answer was to repress, hard. He filled the prisons. Things got really out of hand and 10,000 people stormed the Peruvian embassy, seeking amnesty and a way out. Castro suckered Jimmy Carter, the humanitarian president, into permitting Cubans in America to sail to the port of Muriel and pick up family members who wanted to leave the island. But of course there was a catch. No matter how many family members you came to get, you were only taking one or two on a trip and your boat was being loaded to capacity with other asylum seekers. That didn't mean official safe capacity. It meant as many people as could fit on whatever kind of boat. Forget if it's so low in the water, waves are cresting over the deck. And the asylum seekers were the anti-Castro resistance, along with common rapists and murderers. If your boat didn't sink, you can come back and maybe get another couple family members. The flotilla went on for six months, and people were still trying to get out. My mom was Panamanian. She could leave any time she wanted, but not us. We were good, healthy Cuban kids, and John was 15, almost military age. Mom would do anything she had to do to get us out. But the government was not going to let us leave. Just hating Castro was not a valid reason for deportation. Only criminals were allowed to leave. Mom asked the neighborhood committee of defense boss to write a bad report accusing her of being a prostitute, but she refused. No, I won't do it. You're a good woman and you've got good kids. Unbelievable. She was seriously going to block us from getting out. What difference did it make to her? Mom's only recourse? Terrorize the terrorist regime. She told us to give the boss lady our worst. That night we busted out all of her windows and tore up her metal roof in a downpour. It worked. She denounced my mom in time for us to catch a boat. Maybe. After waiting all day and night, suitcase in hand, we talked to the communist boss at the dock. She refused to approve our exit, and the boat lift was ending in another day or two. So we followed her home and tore her house up. The next day at the dock, she apparently thought, if there are any two people I don't want on this island, it's these two kids. We got on one of the last boats to leave Muriel on August 3rd, 1980. The boat we got on was no bigger than Hemingway's, and it was just as old. They forced 80 people on, standing room only. The engine was rattling and shaking the boat. There were two bigger boats that left at the same time, but they slowly pulled ahead of us. There weren't any lights on the boats, no moon or stars. The boat was sinking so low in the water, everyone was scared to death. We'd rise on a ten-foot swell and suddenly hear crying and praying from one of the boats that had disappeared into the night. The broken-down engines were shaking the boat. Everyone was trembling with fear and cold. Then a roar in the distance came in quick, and a spotlight swept back and forth over us. The gunboat blew past, nearly capsizing us. The sailors made fun of us over the bullhorn. In school, the only maps are maps of the island. You see Russians and you hear about America, but once we left Cuba, we had no conception of the world. We were adrift in darkness and probably about to drown. John and I were kids though. We weren't afraid of anything. Mom was petrified, but you never know what to look at her. The longest night passed. A Coast Guard boat took us into Key West at dawn. So in 1996, we're living in Sarasota and a Cat 4 hurricane hits the Gulf hard. There's massive destruction, and John's been up on coke for five days. And what does he want to do? Come on, let's go cuda hunting. I'm like, screw that, they'd be hunting us. The barracuda is a demonic fish. It's the ultimate predator. They're as fast as torpedoes with fangs that bite through metal. They're so vicious that you can be maimed just reeling one in. And he wants to scuba dive and fight them on their own turf. No way. I don't have a death wish. But Mom intervenes. Your brother hasn't been to sleep. It's dangerous. You go with him and make sure he's safe. End of discussion. On the drive to the pier at Punta Gorda, 
there's a lot of destruction. No stoplights, palm trees down, gas stations blown apart, and the pier is utterly destroyed. Huge sections are collapsed, missing or just hanging from the support columns. But the sky is clear and still, just a little gulf breeze. The water is rough but swimmable. The destroyed pier is the perfect hunting ground for big barracuda. Their favorite prey, the grouper and snook, are guaranteed to be hiding in the wreckage of the pier. It provides ideal protection from the cuda. Cuda are made like missiles. They can swim 45 miles per hour in a straight line, but they're too long to twist and turn after their prey in the close quarters of the wreckage. So John's plan is to swim out into the eighth pole. So John's plan is to swim out to the eighth pole, maybe 80 meters out, and dive down with me. He'll spot a huge, nasty cuda and put a spear in it, and I'll have to hit it again with another one. The cuda he's after are so big, one spear won't do anything but make them mad. On the way to the beach, I ask him if he has any of the exploding tip spears. It's crazy to hunt something like these things without them. They're like hitting a shark or a marlin with a 357 Magnum. Maybe the coke is affecting his judgment. No, we don't need them. Just come in after I hit one and nail them again. So we swim out to the eighth pole and check our air supply. John says, okay, let's go, and dives. As soon as I stick my head in the water, I freeze. Just under the surface, it's solid white, like we're swimming in milk because of the hurricane. I can't go down there. He'll miss a fish and hit me and not even know it. I do the only thing I can, just wait by the pole and hope a cuda doesn't get an artery when it goes after John. There's super glue in the truck, but it'll bleed out before we get back to shore. I wait a while, stick my face back in. I can't see a thing. John bursts to the surface on the other side of the pole. Shoot it! Shoot it! I look back down into the water and right under my feet, emerging from the milk below, is a giant cuda, watermelon-sized head with a bulldog underbite, snapping his fangs at my feet. Somehow he can't quite reach me, though. John shot him through the side of the head and the fish took off after him. He spiraled around the support as he ascended so the cuda would tie itself down. I fumble with my spear gun, point it, and it won't shoot. John swims up behind me, calmly takes the spear gun out of my hands, flips the safety off, and puts the spear right through the cuda's head next to the first one. It quits snapping but keeps thrashing. My brother shares some dive master's wisdom. Fear will cause you to panic, and panic will make all your fears come true. It's true. Sharks smell blood, but cuda smell fear. They love to see another fish or a person in distress. I couldn't just act like I was at home around them like John. This one is six feet long, 120 pounds, head bigger than mine with thumb-sized fangs and two spears sticking out behind its giant black eyes. And he's still pulling at the line with everything he's got. John says, you like motorcycles? What? Just hold the spears like a bike and ride them all the way in. I dove down, grabbed the spears like handlebars, and as soon as John cut the line, we took off. Cruising, with two spears through its head and a man on its back. It only takes a minute to get in. I stand down where the waves start breaking and wrestle the cuda all the way in. The few people on the beach can't believe what they're seeing. The cuda is taller than me. I was done. John borrowed my spear gun and went out and caught two more by himself. I scaled it, skinned it, filleted it, and grilled the cuda with lemon. Americans don't eat them. But Cubans do. They're damn good fish. And we're hungry. Then there was a time we were out on the boat with some girls, drinking beer, doing coke. We dropped anchor and partied for a while. We kept wasabi and soy sauce on the boat so we could dive for some grouper or yellowtail and eat the freshest nigiri around. Somebody dropped a spear gun overboard. It was deep water. John suited up and went down to retrieve it. I'm not sure how long we were sitting around before we started to wonder about him. We saw no bubbles. We pulled up anchor. It was cut. How long had we been adrift? He was nowhere on the horizon. We motored around for hours. Went in and refueled and looked for him until nightfall. He was gone. John dove down and got a spear gun, and when he came up, we were so far away he could barely see us. Of course, he screamed and waved his arms, and nobody noticed. There was no way he was going to catch us swimming. But he didn't panic. He was right at home in the ocean. He knew all he had to do was stay alive and wait, and somebody would spot him sooner or later. He speared some fish, used his diving knife to cut off the head, drank the blood to stay hydrated, leaned back in his flotation vest and filleted the fish on his chest. It rained one day. He let his mask fill up with water to drink. After six days, he was 120 miles out in the Gulf of Mexico. He'd seen two oil tankers pass by without noticing him. A third one saw him and called in his coordinates to the Coast Guard. I asked him, did you make peace with God while you were out there? 
No, I gave him the finger and yelled, I never asked you for shit, and I'm not going to start now. A man or a woman could perform this biographical monologue. Eddie had a shoulder-length, greasy mop and a graying billy goat beard. The little troll told me he was confused about his gender after ten years in the federal penitentiary Atlanta. I didn't delve into that subject any further, but I did hear his life story on repeat, confined with him 16 hours a day for three months. I would never believe a word from anybody I met in prison except Eddie's mom and brother had recently died traumatic deaths. He has no one else, and he would never dishonor their memory with an inaccurate recounting. I never told him, I'm going to write the story of your mom and your brother, but he knew what was going on when I repeatedly revisited his accounts while taking notes. He figured I was a suitable bearer of their memory, since I happened to have recently finished a screenplay on Castro and Kennedy. I consulted him on cultural, historical, and translation points. I was reading 20th century Russians on this bid and was glad to see his Stalin biographies. I felt fortunate that any question I had about Cuba was one he'd been asking himself for decades. And his recollections were good. I tested him constantly for consistency. I asked him how much crack he'd smoked over the course of his life. He took his time to make an accurate estimate, between 50 and 100 kilos. As I sorted through these people's lives, I conceived this monologue as a minimal cell phone video production in two acts. I pictured a cubana on the beach at night relating the story of Cuba and the boat lift. The next scene would be told on the bow of a boat in the sun. The last part could be told from the open water, shot from the boat. For Eddie's question, cut to a profile shot in the water, shoot John's response and gesture from above again. That's how it shook out in my head, and I was compiling this at least. Once I got it down, I realized it's a good fit for any storytelling group session. I also realized that this family's truth heralded a messianic United States Coast Guard, not once but twice. I exacted this story in the beginning of what was shaping up to be an abysmal PR year for the Coast Guard. One thing I left out was brujeria, witchcraft. Eddie's dad married another woman, and one day he opened his wardrobe to find an intricately carved wooden statue of his father. Life-sized covered in chains and animal blood with organs and candles around it. And there were photographs of Eddie, John, and their mom. She went to a witch doctor and paid him all the money she had. The witch doctor was dressed in an all-white suit, went into a trance and danced around shouting at them. It scared Eddie. And the guy was a fraud. He didn't lift the curse. Because on the day they were leaving, they couldn't find Marielle. Their bus took them into the mountains and left them stranded without any money for another ticket. They were hiding from the police at the bus stop, attempting to sneak onto another bus, and a woman in an all-white suit approached them. Don't bother to hide. He can see you. The brujo who's following you. She was a stronger witch than the one Eddie's stepmom had hired. She didn't want any money from them. She lifted the curse, but warned he would come back eventually. They made it to the port and off the island, but the brujo did finally come back for them. Eddie's mom had a horrible death from Parkinson's, and his brother died of an overdose. Eddie blames himself but he is consoled by the fact that his brother is still with him. He told me, I saw a photograph of Castro in the mountains wearing an all-white suit in the old days. A powerful brujo helped him take power and protected him. To Stalin's a quay. The Cave and Odyssey, Blood and Treasure. <laughs> Grabler McConnell, Polite Nero Trump. <laughs> plunder, plunder. <laughs> How will legend recall their toadies? <laughs> King Grim Ryan Bevan. <laughs> Floodworms who defied the odds and evolved to rise to their knees. <laughs> and sucked a shriveled child bugger and prick. Some may reserve a shred of honor for the temper tantrum nincompoop, compulsive liar with more integrity than any liberal apparatchik, biding their time without so much as the nerve to shit on and flog the slut slippers and slaves above deck. Diddy yar, diddy yar, diddy yar. <laughs> to Stalin's a quay.
as you can probably see, we still got a long way to go to get this money together. Uh, maybe you know, things will look a little better after we get our government cheese and, uh, and everybody's a little bit more comfortable. We'll see what happens to everybody who has given a little bit, really. Just really want to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart, from all the uh, bottom of the heart of all the other people who have so much invested in this place as well. Um, let's see. We still have a few more things to go, and we still have a little more time. Uh, briefly, want to give a shout out to my niece, Serene. Uh, thank you for the donation. Very sweet. Very sweet, really appreciate it. Much love to you, I hope you're staying safe and healthy. And I uh, hope everybody else is uh, staying safe and healthy and um, getting to stay in touch with all their people. So uh, yeah, everybody be strong. We'll get through all this craziness. The uh, world might not be the same again, and that just might be a good thing. You know, I have a theory, I think we're all kind of withdrawing from speed here after decades of increasing mania so uh, enjoy the quiet and uh, we'll get used to it and then we'll be back out and about again before too long all right so here next piece is uh, mr. Jameson Welch again <laughs> The music in the background, Impressions to France, is a composition by Maurice Ravel, Camille Sanson, Claude Debussy, Jacques Offenbach, Eric Satie, Francois Adrien Bourdieu, Paul Ducasse, and Buddy Baker, which I think is eerily serene and somewhat comforting at this time. This poem was to be an entry for this year's second annual Kentucky Derby Festival Poetry Derby Contest, which I guess has been scratched or postponed till later. Title Last Derby. Oh, the sun shines bright and the track is the color of my eyes, a little teary at the call to post, which always sounds like taps to me. The momentum mounts as the procession enters the gates. In Dantean splendor, the chosen cavalry, a harlequin mix of beasts and pageantry, the sky all too radiant, the clouds too picturesque, not a shadow or a hat brim out of place as the last bets were laid for the ninth race. Post time and the sound of hoofbeats and cries of jubilant triumph, as though the crowds are watching a rapture. These glad steeds, by their speed are freed, fantastic spirits in a spiral heat. More than thoroughbreds, they are dervishes this time. It was a splendid event and promised to be the best run for the roses ever in the history of the race. Among the spectators, there was a feeling of benign presence of royalty, as if one might expect to see Princess Diana herself with her softly radiant face. The infield was a glittering meadow of brotherhood, men and women engaged in the sacred rite of spring, a parade between parades. Why, even the julep cups brimmed with deliciousness, the sides dripping from the coolness of bourbon and mint and chipped ice. Yes, they finally got it right. And the dust, did I mention the dust? How it slid gently off the backs of the silver hoofs in sepia wisps as they rounded the final turn in the home stretch. Four horses nearly tied for the finish as all four main contenders came in across the line. The pretty black horse was first by a nose, followed by a rare white equine, a mighty red war horse next to a pale gray stallion. All bets were exactas or superfectas. Every single bet was a winner. People were smiling all around, holding their winning tickets. The winner's circle was oblivious, as always. 
as the sun hung in the clouds like a glorious painting, all eyes turned heavenward to see something like a star descend, a bright blossoming colorful point of light, like a rainbow starting to form over the grandstands. Seconds later, the world ends. So uh, everybody's been talking about six feet. So look over and there's six feet. And actually two feet. And then I was like, there's four claw feet. It's just all sorts of stuff around here. So much stuff. So many things to do things with. So hopefully we'll get this place taken care of and get to a point where we're making stuff again. So please consider donating. If you have not, we would so appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back out to do some more here to uh, get a, some more donations, hopefully. And after we get our government checks, um, we have one last video uh, 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 to play at the end here of the mammoth from back in the day, but now we have one more feed. We got a, a little band practice demo. Um, it's pre-recorded. These guys were hanging out together. Um, a band called The Morning. And uh, what was the name of that song? Revealer. Revealer. So uh, pretty cool, pretty cool. Young guys, uh, nice, nice little jam out here. Enjoy, and uh, maybe we'll be back to say goodbye, but we're gonna play that fun fables show for a little bit. Pitching in. doing our first inside shows, uh, did some across the way on the other side of the building, about 100 feet that way, um, 
This is a three-story building, and it is 90,000 square feet, 23,000 square feet per floor. There's a side building next door, um, really perfect for an outdoor venue eventually, probably. Um, there's a backyard we built a space in for a venue. Uh, really beautiful old railroad berm in the back, pathways. Um, we have that stage we've had probably 25 shows back there, all ages. A lot of shows are all ages. Um, what else? We have a stage outside, right in front of the, on the side of the building here too. And we've had um, probably a half dozen shows on that stage as well. And uh, from hip hop shows to um, metal bands with violins to um, Fawn Fables has played here twice outside. Um, that was our first show here with uh, uh, Bonnie Prince Billy, and really honored that Will has played all the spaces I've ever um, had anything to do with. So that was a, a cool thing to check off the list. And um, let me see, what else? We've had Parlor play. Um, a few years ago, we did a five year anniversary show, the Cinco de Mammoth. Um, the uh, Decline Effect played. That was great. Um, had our buddies uh, Shakespeare's Monkey from Evansville come in. Uh, we've just had dozens and dozens of shows. Um, we did a Charlottesville benefit for three days. Uh, we did some um, fire twirling stuff, fire church. Um, what else? You said hip hop shows. And we really like the idea of working with the community out here in West Louisville, having a safe, cool place that's inspiring for people in this part of the neighborhood or in this part of the city. And, uh, you know, the city seems to be moving eastward money-wise. I'm off. Pond tables are ready to go, man. Oh, we're good to go? Yeah, pond tables are here. All right, here we go. Some more of bones and blood. 
try and get a little more of my voice in, the, in this guy down here on my feet. Thank you, there. Thank you, Captain. to undedicate this song to the gentlemen who spent all day hard at work riding their powerful machines up and down this three block stretch of Louisville. Uh, it's, that's a lot of work and, and also you know there can be some real problems with that health problems and I wish them all a safe night. Um, uh, rather, <laughs> rather than my usual dedication of this song to twisted golden braids of meat and fur turning black in the road. So, this is to the, uh, the powerfully endowed gentlemen of Louisville. And, and gentle women, let us hope. I, I have seen some women hanging on to the back. 
as is the tradition. <laughs> No, 
Yeah. Yelling out songs helps. It does. Just a short little song. Thank you.